It's 12.30, right? So I got five minutes to introduce what Ignites are. Welcome to yet another Ignite session, the Ignite session on JFall 2019. Um, does everybody have something to eat? Yeah? You're enjoying yourself. This is just actually lunch entertainment. Nothing more, nothing less. But don't, well, it's not that easy. First of all, who's this first uh, Ignite Sessions? Who's been here before? Who's been here before? Let me keep, who've seen it before? Who've done this before? So the people who've done this before, you know that it's hard, right? Ignite Sessions. It's only, it's only a five minute talk, they say. But what is the Ignite Session? The Ignite Session is a format that, well, basically it already says enlighten us, but make it quick. So that means for the audience, it's easy. If it's cool, in five minutes, you have new information, and we can do this, and you, you're enlightened. If it's boring, you just have to scroll on your telephone for five minutes, and it's over. So either way, it's good, right? But let me get into the dynamics of an Ignite session. What are the rules of an Ignite session? First of all, an Ignite session consists of exactly five-minute talks. Sounds fair, right? The second thing of Ignite is that there are 20 slides, exactly 20 slides, not 19, not 21, 20 slides. That's also feasible. But now the fun part. The fun part is that the speaker does not have any control over his slides. It are 20 slides, and we will auto-forward the slides every 15 seconds. That is the hard part. That means that your timing must be impeccable. Like, if you are done in five seconds, it will be a horrible 10 seconds waiting like this. But if, you're st if you stumble and if you like, uh, 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 then you're already two slides ahead and your story doesn't work anymore. So either you nail it or you fail it. Anyway, it will be fun for us. So that means the hard job is for the people here in the front row. And these are the people who are there, except for this guy, of course, because I'm just doing the introduction. Again, the easy part. These are the gladiators today. They will battle not each other, they will battle time. So I want a big round of applause for these people. Because I believe, I honestly believe that the Ignite thing is something completely different. It will be fun anyway. So thank you, and I appreciate it that you will be here. But there's a first again, because in the history of JFall, we had a couple of Ignite Talks already. I think it's the fourth or the fifth edition already. Fourth, I guess. But this is the first time that we have an Ignite Talk where not one, but two persons try to share their time slot, five minutes, 15 seconds each, together. That's hard. I mean, I find it hard on my own. Let's, let's, that, that you're the two of us. And we have one microphone. Challenge accepted. Right? So I hope everybody is ready. Who's ready for the Ignite Talks? Woo! By the way, I'm Brian, and I'm just a, just ignore me. I will introduce every speaker, one by one, just to make sure that they have just a little time to breathe. I will get my notes up over here so that I actually say the right thing, which would be convenient. So they do not have to introduce themselves, they just need to focus on their talks. There's a second mic. Well, it's already challenging doing it with the two of you, so luckily one challenge less, right? We've got two mics for you. So, um, I always wanted to say that. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's get the first presenter out. Let's give me a, give a big hand to Koturk. <laughs> well, we'll get your slides up yeah, first. Thank you. And let's pray. Ah, we do not have internet over here. Oh, that's convenient. <laughs> there is a wired connect. Oh, probably I have internet. Let me check if I can refresh this one. And if it refreshes, it's instantly. Perfect. So that means I'm going to introduce Ko first. Ko, Ko is a senior Java developer for Blue for IT. Welcome, Ko. Um, he currently works um, at uh, Rabobank as a DevOps engineer. 
he loves uh, he loves full stack, and he already talked at a few conferences like Java Zone in Norway and a couple of Jug tours. And I remember that you talked at one conference in Spain, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, so you already have some conference experience, but now you're gonna do an Ignite talk. It will be hard. It will be hard. <laughs> so I want a big hand for Cole. Give him an applause and. Uh, Take your take take your place. I will I will move the laptop like this so you can Great, see it from from the corner of your eye, and I will start your slides in three, two, one. Let's go. Well, thank you for this uh, nice introduction, uh, Brian. So to all developers out there, don't be afraid to use another ID. So I did a research uh, about IDs. I asked the community, hey, what's your favorite ID? And I will share some results with you. And raise your hands. Who's using IntelliJ? Okay, the most of us. And Visual Studio Code. Oh, still, it's uh, it's it's good. It's good. <laughs> I did uh, I did a research, uh, like I said, and, and the most people where well, it's shocking uh, are using uh, IntelliJ. And um, yeah, the second and third were Eclipse and NetBeans. And the other one, Visual Studio Code, is only used five percent. So not a lot of people were using it. So let's talk about Visual Studio Code. <laughs> Don't say boo or something. <laughs> so what you see in uh, Google Trends is that uh, yeah, more and more people are uh, researching Visual Studio Code. So you see an ascending line there. And yeah, is it a hype or something? Or is it bad documentation maybe? So yeah, let's find it out. Maybe it's really good. I see it also a lot on conferences like Java Zone. I saw it. People were coding in Visual Studio Code. It is possible. So why? Yeah, of course, it's completely free. It's really easy to download. And um, yeah, you don't need the license. Like IntelliJ Ultimate, uh, Ultimate you need to, uh, to pay, but not for Visual Studio Code. Uh, yeah, why it's really cool, you can install uh, really cool quality-wise uh, plugins. So they really have some uh, nice plugins, all based on plugins. So yeah, that's why it's also late, lightweight. Uh, for example, it's only 70 megabytes, so if you download it, it's very fast, uh, especially if you have a connection like this, but yeah, <laughs> we have wired cable, right? So that's good. Um, yeah, so like IntelliJ, uh, yeah, uh, th uh, this one is, uh, for example, it's very fast. It's not a Mercedes or it's not a Ferrari, but it's very fast. It's in startup time, it's only 11 seconds. So that's pretty cool. Like, uh, yeah, it's very uh, quick. Uh, what I also like is, uh, like Visual Studio Code, is um, yeah, they do a lot of releases. Every month they release something, and they have a lot of committers, so they're doing really cool stuff and yeah, releasing every month, minimal one day or one month. Um, yeah, it, you can use it for Java, for example, but it's mostly used for TypeScript and JavaScript because yeah, yeah, it's Microsoft, so uh, yeah, you can use it for Java, but how can we do that? Yeah, you just download it, and the first thing you need to do is download the Java extension pack. It's all based, not uh, supported by default, it's all supported by Red Hat. So you need to install the Java extension pack, which consists about Maven, for example, and that kind of things. And if you install it, you don't need to restart your whole uh, 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 ID. So you just push the reload button, and it's just done. So that's very easy. Um, yeah, Git uh, Lens is also a good plugin. What I like is uh, the pull request reviewing. Mostly, uh, when you, for example, use uh, GitHub, uh, yeah, you need to go to the website and then check the pull request. But you can also do it in your ID. So that's a really cool plugin just to be in your ID. And pair, pair, pairing is possible with uh, other colleagues. You can just share your uh, your workspace with other ones. Especially, it's very handy if you uh, pair with uh, juniors or other ones. So I like this plugin very much. I also like uh, this plugin if you want to debug, like uh, in JavaScript, a ty a JavaScript. Uh, then you can set debug points. So this is also a plugin. Yeah, you don't need to start up Chrome, for example. It's just starting up for you, and you can set breakpoints and that kind of things. So it's pretty neat. What I also like is, for example, uh, the run and debug possibilities. You can just see, hey, I can run this test. I can just click it. You can just see it right away that you can run it, and you have no problems or something. But no use shortcuts, of course. 
Uh, what I also like is the themes, uh, like the icons. If you have an Angular application, for example, you can see the Angular icon. Uh, you just see in one eye that, uh, yeah, that it's using Angular. And it's very smart. Uh, for example, in IntelliJ, we have the Kodota plugin. Uh, you can see uh, which commands are used the most. So be all based on GitHub, you can see uh, which is the most, uh, and that's on top. So this is my Ignite session. <laughs> After se uh, the ses session, uh, so yeah, send me a tweet or something, or yeah, if you have questions. I'm also uh, presenting Battle of IDs on GVMCon and uh, DevNexus. Thank you. All right. <sighs> Now you, can, uh, now you can easily breathe again. Yeah. And you can talk <laughs> slowly again. Yeah, thank isn't, you. Isn't, isn't that nice? Yeah, it's very nice. You did quite well. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. A big, ra big round of applause for Cole. <laughs> All right. Um, I will introduce, um, I will ask the next, next speaker to come up. It will be uh, Bart van Wezel. Hi, Bart. Are you, are you nervous? Yes. Yes, I, you should be. <laughs> but again, you will, you will do fine. I will, get, I will get your slides up first, hopefully. Because, well, you see, I'm very good at Google Slides. Yes, this is the one. All right, first I will introduce Bart, of course. Bart is a software craftsman. I love that word, craftsman. It sounds like, like you're making wooden shoes or something. For, for, for Code-centric. Um, and you will talk about reinforced learning, of reinforcement learning, or whatever, something with learning. Maybe I'll learn something. Um, well, you're a craftsman at, at Code-centric, and you love to play with new techniques, and, uh, well, you love innovation. As, um, as your bio says. Um, anything else to add? No? Should we just give it a go? Yes. Big round of applause for Bart. <laughs> and the floor is yours in three, two, one. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I have a hearing disability, so my English might sound a little bit different, but I hope you still enjoy the session. Uh, in elementary school, our teacher would give us an assignment and uh, when we we're done, we had to hand it in. And if we did correctly, we would get a sticker. With this reward, uh, a teacher tried to motivate us to uh, do our best on the assignment and to hand it in when we we're done. Rewards are not only used to uh, teach humans uh, new behavior, we can also use rewards to teach a uh, dog how to sit. The rewards do not always have to be positive. You can also give negative feedback if your dog does something wrong. If we apply the same principle uh, to make machines or computers learn something, it's called reinforcement learning. Uh, in reinforcement learning, the machine or the uh, computer is usually called the agent. The agent is the one that's going to make the decision. Um, the agents need to know something about the environment. So we have to map the current state of the environment to the agent so the agent can make a decision. So uh, what's happening in the environment, uh, we have to translate it so the agent can understand it. Uh, based on the current state, the agent choose one action. Uh, we have to provide all the actions the agent can choose from, and it cannot make up new action. So in, after the agent chooses an action, something happens in the environment. Uh, something positive or negative can happen in the environment, and we have to map it back to the agent. So if something positive happens, we, uh, we apply a positive reward to the agent. Um, not all actions uh, trigger a reward. Some of the actions do change the state of the environment, but do not uh, give a positive or negative reward. So after each action, we also have to apply the new, uh, give the new state to the agent. For example, making the assignment in elementary school did not give me a, a reward directly, but it get, get me in a state closer to a reward. So the, how the agent chooses an action, uh, there are many different kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms. I'm not going to go into detail in this session, but most of them consist of two phases, an exploration phase and an exploitation phase. During the exploration phase, the agent chooses uh, actions and try to discover as much possible actions as possible. And what he learned there uh, is uh, used in the exploitation phase to maximize the actions with the most reward. For a short recap, uh, we have a current environment. Uh, we map the state to the agent. The agent chooses an action and the reward and the state are given back to the agent so you can learn from it. So if we go back to the elementary school example, the example action would be make the assignment or hand in the assignment. State would be based on the workbook with a finished or unfinished example, and the reward would be whether I got a sticker or not. 
So how is this used in real world application? For example, a lot of uh, recommendation systems are based on reinforcement learning. And the action here is to choose a top X amount of videos for you to recommend. So here the, the, action, the state is based on the current video you're watching and information about your user. Um, if you watch a lot of cat videos in the, in the past, uh, the sense is higher that the uh, cat video is recommended. You watch it based on whether you click on one of the videos and the amount of time you keep spending on YouTube. Uh, Netflix also uses a form of reinforcement learning to determine the artwork of the movies. If you watch a lot of comedies, uh, they would display the artwork with a comedian. Um, if you watch a lot of romances, they would show the artwork with a romantic tune. Um, it's also already used in chemical reactions. Uh, here, multiple chip tensors are brought together and want to trigger a chemical reaction to get different chip tensors. So the actions here are to change the temperature up or down uh, at catalyst chip distance to trigger the reaction as the agent can choose to wait some time or change the behavior value. Um, the state is also based on this, uh, this action. So the state is whether the current temperature, the current chip distance, uh, current behavior value. And the reward is based on when the product is done or not. Um, the reward is higher when it took less action. So the more actions it took, the lower the reward. So also, the honorable mentions I counted during uh, researching a uh, product uh, system. For example, in data cylinder cooling, the reward is based on the temperature in the room. When the temperature goes up, a negative reward is applied. And the action is based on the controlling of the fan systems. Um, I hope you learned uh, how you can apply reinforcement learning to your own problem. And if you still have any questions, you can meet me at the Cocentric booth. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Bart. Amazing. Thank you. This this is nice because after after five minutes it will go it will go on lockdown. So you can try to make it six, but no, it will, will not work for you. Let's get to the next one. This will be the next one. So Paul, here you got the mic. But I first introduce you. You can take a breath or two. No worries. No worries. No worries. Um, next speaker will be Paul. Paul Krak. He is uh, well the general manager and one of the co-founders of Craftsman, the company Craftsman. So you have a lot of Craftsman, right? Oh, yeah, cool. Um, Paul has uh, uh, been in IT since 2009, when I was still in diapers. Uh, in 2010, uh, you developed, a, developed an intake training for software engineers, and that's what your, your, your talk is about, right? How to get a successful intake. So who of you did an intake once, twice, three? Who failed? <laughs> well, who failed once at least? So it is, it is still something we can fill in. Al although the market is good, it's still something we can learn. So. Are you ready? I am. Cool. So then I will say, I will, I will keep it like this. You can see it like this. I will give you the countdown in three, two, one. Let's hit it. Okay. Hi, everybody. All of you who are working within uh, software consultancy know that you have to do an intake to start working at the customer. And today I'm going to tell you more about the secrets behind the successful intake. And actually, it all starts with an open vacancy at the customer. A customer is looking for a software engineer and has set up a set of requirements and put out his vacancy to the market. And then your, uh, you can send over your resume. And the first thing a customer will do when he receives your resume is he's going to see whether there is a match between their requirements and your resume. And uh, that's based upon what you have done in the past. And if, that's, uh, if there's a match, he will invite you for an intake. And an intake is actually a test. And the essence of an intake is that the customer is going to decide whether they are going to hire you, yes or no. And the decision is based upon your story. Your story will define whether the customer will hire you, yes or no. So it's important to understand the intake flow. Let's take a look at the intake. Customer, during the intake, the customer will want to confirm if you are the right guy for the, for the job. So he wants to see whether you have worked with the right tool stack, you have done similar activities, and uh, he wants to get to know you as a person. And everything you tell him will lead to a first impression, a feeling, and it's all about trust at the end. Because uh, the customer will decide, well, is this the good guy for the job? Or girl, sorry, girls. And if you want to wind up at the positive side of things, then you must understand that most decisions are taken in the first 
five to 10 minutes. So a customer will decide whether they move forward with you in the first five to 10 minutes. So make sure that your first five to, to 10 minutes are really relevant. So let's take a look at the intake. A customer will start with an introduction. They will tell you something about the department and the project and then the essence. And why are you here? What do we expect from you? But in most cases, the customer skips phrase three. Uh, they, 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 and, and you have to ask that. You must make sure before you introduce yourself that you ask a question and that, they, that you really know what they are looking for and what they do expect from you. So that's, in, that's important. So, and then it's your time to introduce yourself. You will start with an introduction, then you will tell something about your career, and there's, there's time for questions and answers. And you can prepare all these steps. And let's like, uh, take a look at the introduction. Because this is the first thing they hear from you. And it's good to prepare this. So to get a good impression and make sure that you already answer relevant questions. For example, how do you keep up uh, with new technologies? And in the second phase, you're going to tell more about your relevant projects. And make sure that there is a match between what they expect you, what you are going to do, and what you have done. So, and it, there is a very easy way to prepare, to prepare relevant examples. And you can take these seven steps to give a customer really good examples by creating context, giving them proof that you are the right guy, and ask a question to start a technical discussion. So let's zoom into the context. How can you create context? You tell something about the customer, the core business, what your role was, and uh, you give some context about the application and the purpose of the application you worked on. For example, yeah, I was working at, uh, at Bull.com and I was working uh, within the logistics department and I was working there as a software engineer and I worked on the application same day delivery which takes care of delivering goods at the same day at our customer. In the second phase, you're going to tell something about the proof. The proof. Which tool stack did we use? What kind of activities did I do? And what was the result? And important is that you create a match between the expectations and the requirements of the customer and what you have done. How do you do that in practice? I was working on the same day delivery application. We used Java 11, we worked with microservices, and my role in the team was, I was responsible for building those microservices. And the result is that they are now running on production. And then you're up for the next phase to start a technical discussion. Uh, step seven, ask a relevant question to start a, a technical uh, conversation with the customer. So you told hi him something, now he, it's up to them to tell more about their environment. And at the end, there is time for questions and answers. And I give you those top 10 questions for free. And final tip, answer every question with an example. Make sure that you are relevant. And if you want to receive those, just send me a message or uh, via mail or LinkedIn. And I want to thank you all for listening to my presentation. And have a great day at JVAL. All right. So these were your five minutes to, impre to impress. Um, don't call us, we call you, right? Yeah, 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 Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> all right. So far, this is one of the only sessions that people jump in and jump in instead of getting out. That's good. You're doing a good job. Keep that up. No, no pressure for the rest of you, of course. The next one. And that will be the special one, because this one is that, that double duo presentation, that co-talk. One, two. Here you go. Let me first introduce you. No. No. I will get rid of the cursor right away there. So we're not started yet. E. Don't, don't. They're nervous. And now you're asking questions. They only have five minutes. So next, be, next up are uh, Arjen Kok and uh, uh, Polina Kocheneva, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Thank you. Both from Word Systems. And uh, they will talk about mentoring a junior, pro, uh, a junior developer. Uh, Arjen is a, uh, well, uh, this, you, you worked as a full stack developer, solution architect, and, uh, and, and scrum master. And now you're doing work as a coach and trainer, if I'm not mistaken, right? Polina, you just started like over a year, slightly over a year ago, and you're a junior developer. So I'm curious how you two did that. So if you are ready, let's give you the countdown in two, three, two, one, and let's hit it. Hello, Jay Fall. My name is Arian Koch. 
Uh, I work for Worth Internet Systems. And one of the first conversations I had when I joined the company was that we should do a traineeship because they wanted new talent, they wanted to train people. And since I had some experience, they said, go ahead and do it. And so I found three awesome candidates uh, to do the traineeship, one of which is here today. Hi, yeah, it's me, my name is Paulina. I'm a software engineer currently at Worth Systems and it started a bit less than a year ago. Uh, as Aaron told, I started with a couple more peers on that way. That was super nice not to be alone there. Uh, we provided each other with a lot of support, some spirit of friendly competition, and a lot of beginners friendly explanation over some tools and concepts. Yeah, that was very necessary because I prepared the curriculum from pre existing materials, and for some topics, it's really hard to find beginner friendly materials. And there was one in particular that was very hard. Yeah, it's true. The, I still have nightmares and PTSD over Spring Dogs. Like, no matter how good they are for developers, when you just started into the field, it's just a nightmare. Since the first sentence, it was just going into the rabbit hole of tech jargon. I have to Google basically each second war word in a sentence. It, yeah, it's it, disaster. Yeah, so it, it, it was a little bit hard and we had to have extra sessions to fill in the gaps. I didn't expect them to understand all of the spring docs. It was just the introduction part, but even that was hard. Um, but they weren't just researching things. They had quizzes, they had coding assignments, and they also had projects. Yeah, actually, the project was the best. Yeah, the projects were very fun. We, we built a game, a chat app, and things like that. And we also got a Scrum Master to facilitate their process. And the support uh, was necessary because towards the end, three quarters into the traineeship, there was a little bit of panic. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I have no idea why, but for some reason, all three of us have the feeling that every tool, every concept RN gives to us to learn, we have to master. And like in four or five hours. And uh, we start to struggle with that. And I'm really thankful that the company and our in created that atmosphere where we can raise our voice and concern and not just suffer in silence. Yeah. No, so they were very honest. We had a good conversation and I'm really happy they brought it up because I was able to reassure them. And uh, it was just in time because uh, we were about to start the final project. Yeah, uh, actually finance project was the best. We have real project, to real product owner and requirements. And it lasted for two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a struggle every morning because you have to deal with a completely new library you have no idea about. Uh, and I was like swearing and cursing a lot during the first half of the day. But at the end of the day, we usually went home with some new feature working completely. And the greatest part about doing this project is, uh, I think, that all trainees need is it builds up a confidence as a developer in you. So that, yeah, and I mean, the aim was to do it as realistic as possible. The product owner was an actual client product owner that doubled as for the traineeship project. Um, we had a full deployment pipeline. It was full stack. And uh, we, should, we demoed it to the rest of the company, to their colleagues, and people were pretty impressed. We had a little ceremony, they got certificates with their picture on it, and it's all very official. Um, and towards the end, uh, they had to choose their specialty, whether they were going to be front-enders or back-enders, and then they joined real teams. Yeah, so I joined a support team as a software engineer, and yeah, so with all these build-up confidence as a developer, and then I went to the projects and understood, like, there's 95% at least, I have no idea what's happening there. And, uh, like, I don't understand, I don't know even some files extensions. So it took me around, like, a couple more months to get up to speed and be definitely, like, valuable addition to the team. Uh, but what I have to say is that training should definitely speed up this process. Uh, and, uh, yeah, really. And also took a lot of like struggle and stress from that way uh, of starting to work on the real project in real team. Yeah, so I think looking back, that was exactly the intention. It was supposed to be just enough preparation to get into a team and be productive relatively quickly. Um, and I think we were very lucky to be in a situation and at a company where there was room. Uh, there was this, this uh, corporate sponsorship to set aside resources and budget to have a traineeship in the first place. So honestly, I would love to do it again. We learned a lot from doing it. We would be better the second time around. around. And, oh, uh, have you? <laughs> and so um, I, I really want to recommend every company that has this room, that has corporate sponsorship, please do a traineeship. And if you have any questions on how to do that, ask us after, after this. Thank you. Thank you.
That was impeccable, right on time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. We're, all, we're already halfway. So who's still with us? Who likes it? The rest of you sleeping or digesting their food? Anyway, we're going up to the next one, and the next one will be Bart. Bart Tusha. Unlock. Yes. Let me get the right slide deck up. This is your slide deck, right? Cool. If you said no, we had a huge problem, though. All right. Uh, Bart is a software engineer at Simacon. It, do I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. All right. Uh, 30 years old, living in Amersfoort, and you're working for Simacon for five years now. And your, respons uh, your responsibility and passion is in core service platforms. Mm -hmm. All right. You're going to talk about vendor lock-in. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a good one. So, oh, a mic. It's a good one. Maybe he can. He's already so nervous that that maybe he can speak at that loud. <laughs> Test it if it works. Hello, hello. Yes, it works. Awesome. So, yes, I will give you the countdown like everybody else. Like three, two, one, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Bartuse. I'm a software engineer at Simacan. I've been for the last five years. At Simacan, we build software to make traffic and logistics data more accessible to our users. We do so by giving transporters and retailers uh, a view in the current state of their operation. Uh, to make this possible, we have a cluster of more than 100 services, and a lot of data is moving between each of these services. Of course, these services require authorization uh, to uh, provide uh, data to our users, for which we use the OF2 protocol. Um, to pri provide authorization to our services, we needed a platform. And at the time, we decided to go with a SaaS because we felt our time would be better spent uh, in improving our products rather than building a new platform. Um, which sounds fair enough, I suppose. It wouldn't make sense to reinvent the wheel. Uh, many uh, SaaS providers have already solved this problem for us, so it wouldn't make sense to uh, implement a, the platform ourselves. Well, except uh, after a year or so, uh, we got a mail from our SaaS provider stating, we're excited to announce we are teaming up with a different company to give you an even better experience. So okay, fair enough, I guess. And as a result, uh, our services and APIs will reach end of life in the next few months. Yeah. Not great. Um, so basically, they had been bought by a larger company. Um, so for us, this meant we needed to migrate to a new stack before this end of life deadline was reached. Otherwise, our users would not be able to log in and not be able to use our products anymore, which means we would have a lot of unhappy customers. Uh, luckily, at the time, we decided to put an interface in between our services and the SaaS. Uh, um, <laughs> which is used to translate, uh, basically, requests incoming to the SaaS. Also, um, this was very important for us because uh, it allowed us to only change a single interface rather than having to update a lot of different services, which would uh, mean a lot of work. So it saved us a lot of time. Uh, in addition, uh, it allowed us to migrate without any downtime. Uh, we used the interface to connect to two authorization platforms at once. So the old uh, sessions would be handled by the old stack, and the new sessions would be handled by the new stack. Um, and this was part of the reason we managed to migrate in time. Although not ideal, the silver lining here is that we at least used some time to implement and improve our authorization stack. Although not quite out of free will, at the end of the day, we did improve our um, product. Uh, though. We prefer this to be a choice and not a need. So what can we do to avoid or at least mitigate this situation? 
Well, for one, we could check how well a SaaS provider is doing. Are they currently working on the SaaS you might subscribe to? How big is this company? How many customers do they have? And are these customers actually happy? Um, note though, it doesn't necessarily mean a larger company is better. I mean, there's always a bigger fish. Um, uh, of course, uh, you might also opt to host something yourself. Uh, there are many open source solutions out there which uh, provide an alternative to the SaaS. Uh, and if you can afford the time and energy, it might be a good idea. Um, also, try to put your eggs in different baskets. Um, uh, you might want to use a single SaaS for everything, though migrating from it will be a nightmare. That's it for me. Thank you all for listening and have a great day at JFAL. All right, thank you. You did great, man. Thanks. We got two more left. Next one is uh, Martijn. No, these are not your slides. And ni ni neither are these my holiday pictures, unfortunately. If I'm not mistaken, this is your starting slide, right? All right. Uh, so, uh, Martijn is a Java consultant at CodeClan. Um, you love sharing your, your knowledge and you, you sp spread it around. And uh, that's, why you, that's why you're here. And you're going to talk about your first talk at JFall, which basically is this talk, right? Now, so you got to my... So that's, that's like kind of incepting. Yeah. How, how, how do I do my own talk? Uh, you said you, you, love, you love Java and TypeScript. How could you... Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> And in your spare time, you do you design light shows for theaters and festivals. Oh, that's a cool thing. But let's get, get back to that later. I will uh, give you the floor in um, three, two, one, and here you go. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, when I prepared this talk, I was uh, afraid that it was going to be empty. But it's full. Um, and I'm a bit nervous, so bear with me. It's only five minutes, so I'm going to survive. You should also be. And I'm going to tell you something about uh, the preparation of my um, first talk at the conference. And maybe on any talk you can give to your um, colleagues or to any people. I'm going to tell you something about things I find important to do in a, in a talk. And some yeah, struggles I found when preparing this one. I bet every one of you have ever had uh, an idea or something he saw that he wanted to share with his colleagues. And most of the time people don't share that. Why not? They are afraid. People are going to laugh, or people already know that. And that is not true. Um, it's all about teamwork in our business. So when we share the knowledge we have, you should do it with, with your team. You get a better understanding of that knowledge. And you get also a, um, um, a feeling to share knowledge to maybe bigger groups. When you have the sharing of knowledge in your team, your team can work with it and they can um, yeah, apply those knowledge uh, at the same time. I found out that sharing knowledge is a lot of fun, but yeah, then you need to have some ideas, some suggestions. You can do something like this. I uh, Google whipped it, so not all interesting subjects, but very good. And when you have an ID, you can look um, how to present it, how to do it. You can look at other speakers, and you can note what you like and what you dislike, about their way of presenting and try to avoid or do them in your own presentations. Um, for this uh, talk, it was mandatory to have a slide deck, but sometimes you don't even need a slide deck. You can do some live coding um, with some notepad, for example, to give some highlights. And um, yeah, when I said this talk needs a slide deck, um, I bet you all have seen this kind of slides once in a while. We can try to read it. This was a, uh, a small buffer, so you can, you can try it. But I think it's not good. There are several ways, and I come up to it. Even if you remove the picture, it's still not good. By the way, this is another text, but people are going to read it. I see all the eyes, and they're not paying attention to what I said. 
that's not the important thing. Um, if you need to have some, um, yeah, some bullets in your slides, I think that the right one is better because it uses pictures, images than the left one. People can see in, in one eye what it's talking about and what it's saying. But if I tell you that 94.3% of the people will believe a made-up fact more even when it's a detailed percentage used, this one is enough. Just say this. It's okay. Yeah. Ah, cool. <laughs> I remember I found out that some people like to um, attach image to their, uh, to their brains. When your brain sees an image, you are more likely to remember it. This glass of beer is only in it uh, because I like beer. Uh, nobody will remember that even a beer was in this presentation. So the image you use should have some relevancy with the presentation you are giving. When you ever have everything set up, you need to practice. And how can you do better practice than in front of a mirror or in front of a small group of, of colleagues? That's not scary at all. Um, they will give you feedback. They will say if you have um, an enjoyable presentation to watch, if you, the message is clear that what you want to say is okay, they will not level you and they will only tell you something to make it better. You can also go to meetups. When you go to meetups, you have several advantages. You see other people speaking, you can learn from them, and you get the chance of drinking beers with colleagues who are enthusiastic about the subject. It's really, really nice. When I made this presentation, I had one slide left. So for the few of you who doesn't know TEDx, just find it out. It's a lot of presentations of all different kinds of subjects. You can see how other people are presenting and you can and yeah, grow your knowledge. One thing you should remember about this presentation is to never be afraid to present, to share your knowledge. It's not scary at all. Well, in the beginning it is scary, but you find out that it will be less scary when you do it more often. Be enthusiastic about it. I find it a joy to uh, listen to one who was talking about paper clips, if it is their passion. If somebody talks about their passion, it can be quite enjoyable to watch. And yeah, you should be not like standing like this. That's that was a that, that was it. That was it. Let me show the last slide slide again. Thank you. Yeah. All right. That was a quick five minutes. Uh, uh, Sorry, yeah, 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 but it was, it was, it was actually, it was like very short five minutes. I made it shorter, but yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Good job, thank you. Another round of applause for my time, please. <laughs> All right, um, sometimes they say we, uh, we, we, well, we spare the best for last, right? So, Kai, are you ready? Who likes superheroes? Who, 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 who hates superheroes? Move out, please. She's already nervous, come on. So we're gonna talk about superheroes. Five superheroes you need in your team. I will give you the mic first and I will of course introduce you because you're a, a Java developer at ING and well, you studied communication and multimedia design. How did you transfer over to IT? You just found out it was fun and you started it with it, right? Uh, I thought computers are boring and then I started designing and then I thought, Oh, but designing is only for taste. I start computing, and then computing is also about taste, so I don't know anymore. <laughs> That's a good cue. Well, let's get to your talk. Five superheroes you need in your team. This is the last speaker. Give it a give it, give it a big hand. Up. <laughs> All right, Kaya, the floor is yours in three, two, oh, what? Three, two, one, and let's go. Okay, so you guess without slides, I'll say that every team has its superheroes. Sometimes you won't recognize them directly, but they can be a great value of your team. I will show you five unexpected superheroes who can bring you a lot. So first I want to make a little disclaimer. I may have had some true facts, but I may have had also parts who are a little bit exaggerated. And I have some inspiration of my own team, but they're not here, so that's fine. <laughs> so let's continue. Our first hero is the super uh, grumpy cat. So sometimes you won't even notice he, he is there, until he starts complaining again about something. And if I say good morning, I normally get, <laughs> I see some people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's continue. But there's magic inside. When you think he's ignoring you, he's thinking about the brilliant solution for your problem. His brain is making connections when you think he's just doing nothing. 
And also, it's really time saving because he is ignoring you as part of a uh, cover. So he's actually doing that so you don't come to his desk until it's really, really necessary, which is really time saving. So it's quite smart. So let's go to the next one. It's the bad joke machine. So this person, or actually, sorry, it's nearly always a man who keeps making bad jokes. And all, when you think it can't get any worse, the next joke is even less funny than the way, one before. But still, most of the time I have to laugh. And even a bad joke is better than no jokes at all. So it is good for a team to embrace humor, even in its worst form. And also, the entry level is like really low. It's nearly at the ground at our team. But it helps you too. It may, it's easier to make jokes. It encourages people. And also, your own jokes will look way funnier because the rest is just so bad. Our next one is the but why repeater. So this person asks why all the time. Every question uh, is been asked, and or everything that's been said, a question is asked. Even food and clothing choices are questioned by this person. It's really annoying, but it can help you to get to the core of the problem. The perfect idea can be broken down by a simple why question. So it really helps you to find out what matters the most. And also it helps you to find out what the customer really wants. Because I think we all know that what the customer or business say that they want is not really what they exactly need. So asking a lot of times why helps you to get to the core of what they really need instead of what they think they want. So the next one is the business mediator. This person has some weird opinion that we should not blame the business for everything and that we should just ask for input if we have questions about stories that aren't properly refined. And although it can be annoying, it really helps you to have better collaboration because better collaboration results in better products. So that's for everyone uh, nicer to work on. And if you have better products and, a ha and you have a happy business, and better products and a happy business will result in more celebrations, which result in more cake and champagne. So everyone is happy. So our next superhero is boom, the last one, the over-enthusiastic junior. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't so laugh so hard. This one is based upon me. <laughs> but um, this person is way too happy to pick up an average story and wants to know everything. So... For the persons around, uh, it can be annoying sometimes, but this person also has a different view upon things. And it can help if you're not spoiled with history in discussions. And also the most simple questions can lead to totally new ideas. Also, this person is quite naive, but it can help because others are already tired of all the previous attempts to change, for example, the way of working. And this person has still the energy and drive to change, to try at least. And at last, you can be really happy that the person is getting you some coffee. But then don't get someone like me, because you need to get your coffee by yourself. But you can always try it. So I hope that you've seen that also the most unexpected superheroes can be of a great value of your team. <laughs> so they don't have to look a certain way. They can be everything. So I want to encourage you to look in your own team to find superheroes. And if you're complaining that you really, really can't find any superhero in your team, I suggest you look a little closer, because you might be the grumpy cat yourself. Thanks for your attention.